Hello, my name is Tony Hyman. I'm a director of Max Planck Institute at Dresden in Germany. And for the second part of my talk, I'd like to tell you about polymers, microtubules, which are a fascinating part of the mitotic spindle, which I've illustrated over here in this little uh, cartoon. If you remember in the last talk, and when we're discussing about scale in biological analysis, microtubules are organizations of protein molecules called tubulin, shown here. And tubulin molecules come together to organize these microtubule polymers. Now you can look at microtubules growing in cells, and in this movie, you can see the ends of microtubules growing throughout our C. elegans embryo. The ends of the microtubules are marked with a protein called EB1, which is known to follow and recognize only the beginnings of microtubules growing from centrosomes. Now, microtubules have interesting organization. On the top, I've shown you dimers. We know the structure of the dimer in detail from a number of different structural techniques, such as crystallography and also from uh, electron microscopy. And dimers form head-to-tail arrangements of protofilaments, which I've shown down here using a technique called atomic force microscopy. But then these protofilaments associate side to side to form a tube. And in vivo, there are about 13 protofilaments per microtubule. And the bottom, you're seeing a microtubule by, in a technique known as vitreous ice, where you can see the individual protofilaments. The interesting thing about microtubules is that they grow from their ends. So you have a polymer, which is the tube, and individual subunits come onto the ends, and they leave the ends. And therefore, you have an on rate of tubulin subunits and an off rate. And the growth of microtubules is defined by these different rates. The other interesting thing about microtubules is they have polarity. So you have a tubulin dimer, but the dimer is a heterodimer with two different subunits, alpha and beta. And those alpha-beta subunits set up a polarity inside the microtubule with the beta subunit at the plus end. So the beta subunit marks the plus end of the microtubule. And in the cell, the plus ends tend to be out in the periphery of the cell, and the minus ends are concentrated at the centrosome. So a microtubule will nucleate from a centrosome, grow out through the cell with its plus ends leading. So it has dynamics, but it also has polarity. Now, we can look at microtubules growing in vitro. So you can isolate tubulin from cells. One of the key places we isolate it from is brain. There's a massive amount of tubulin in brain because it makes up all our neurons. And then we can study microtubules growing in a test tube, as I've shown in this movie. The big structure here is a centrosome, which we've also isolated from the cell. We've isolated tubulin, and you can see it growing out along the cover slip um, simply from uh, the tubulin molecules themselves. So in theory, microtubules do not require any other proteins to grow. Um, these are just simple polymer systems. But microtubules in vivo, in the cell, have very different behavior than microtubules in a test tube. And the key difference is that for any particular tubulin concentration, microtubules grow faster in vivo than they do in a test tube. And they grow much faster, sometimes 10 times faster than you expect. The other thing is they tend to turn over more quickly in cells than they do in a test tube. So what I've illustrated here is an interesting behavior known as dynamic instability, where you can see the microtubule grows. And at some stages, it, tr tr it transitions to a shrinking state and then it starts growing again. And what you can see is both in vivo and in vitro, microtubules are turning over by dynamic stability, but they're much more dynamic in cells than they are in a test tube. And that's something that's interested uh, scientists for the last 25 years, ever since the discovery of these differences between the properties of microtubules in vitro and those in vivo. And we want to understand how microtubules are regulated in a cell in a vivo context, because that regulation is key to their activity in the cell. Building a mitotic spindle, for instance, requires that the activity of microtubules is regulated.
One of the questions you can ask, and we always have to ask of biologists, if you're interested in a problem like that, so you, you've looked at your microtubules growing in a cell, and then you say to yourself, I'm interested in that problem. How am I going to get at it? And the first thing you tend to ask yourself as a biologist is, well, how complicated is it? Is this a soluble problem? Can I get at it? And here's a review um, from Rebecca Held illustrating the numbers of different micro proteins that are known to be involved in regulation of microtubules. And you look at that, and it looks fairly terrifying. There's so many different molecules involved in the different processes. But So we decided to go and ask, how complicated is the growth of microtubules in a C. elegans embryo? And we just decided to focus on one particular problem, which is how many proteins are required to make the plus center of a microtubule grow fast through the cytoplasm. If you remember, I said that it grows about 10 times faster in vivo than it does in vitro. So you can ask how many proteins are required to do that. And we did that by taking advantage of our genome-wide RNAi screen. I mentioned this screen in the introduction, um, and this screen is an RNA interference screen where we can look for genes required for microtubule growth. And to do that, we took our large set of 800 genes, and we decided to screen subsets of those for those that affected microtubule growth. So you remember our first screen was using the masking microscopy, and we couldn't see microtubules. It would have been too complicated for us at the time to screen everything by fluorescence microscopy. But with our subset of genes, we can ask which one of those are having their effects on the embryo because they prevent the microtubules from growing properly. And here's a movie where you can see the plus ends of microtubules growing by EB1, as I mentioned. And we can also track these microtubule ends automatically, which helps a lot in interpreting the phenotype. So in essence, this is the outline of our screen now, is we've taken the DIC screen, the Namaski screen, and we've taken a number of genes, and we've got a set of genes here required for cell division. So we believe, our hypothesis is, that any gene which affects microtubule growth is likely to uh, make the embryo not divide properly. So we take those genes and do some bioinformatics to su subselect the genes to reduce the amount of work we have to do. And then we do our fluorescent secondary screen using various different fluorescent markers. And we look for the number of genes required for microtubule growth. And when we did that, the results were really quite interesting because they actually showed that many, not many genes are required for a microtubule to grow. If you have a look at this, this uh, rather complicated bar chart here, the white lines are showing the growth rate of microtubules. So on this particular axis, we had the growth rate of microtubules. And you can see this layer here is about the growth rate of wild-type microtubules. So then you can say, let's go through the genes and ask which genes no longer grow at wild-type rates. And I've I put those in a circle, you can see that there's a set of genes here, two, which are clear required for microtubules to grow. There's some other genes over here which also prevent microtubule growth, but we know that those are required to actually make the tubulin dimer itself. So obviously, if you don't have enough tubulin, you're also not going to grow. Those are interesting. We're not interested in those for this particular tool. We actually want to know when the tubulin is made, what proteins are required to make the microtubules grow. And here, all that work, we came up with two proteins that seem to be required for that, TAC and Zyg9, which we happen to know are actually in a complex. So there's a complex of proteins which are required for the growth of microtubules. Now, it turns out that this protein, which is in the middle here, Zyg9, is part of a family of proteins. XMAP is one of the founder members in high eukaryotes. There's Stu2 in Cerevisiae, and there's DIS1 in Pombi. And every organism studied so far, every animal cell studied so far, has a member of this family. And they have these very interesting domains in them called TOG domains. As you can see here, XMAP has five TOG domains. C. elegans has three TOG domains. These yeasts have two TOG domains, but are thought to be in a dimer. So, so far, what we've done is we've discovered then that actually, in an embryonic system, controlling the growth rate of microtubules is quite simple. You need these two proteins. And that is the first part of any 
particular project in trying to work on any biological process. We've done what's known as a genetic screen using RNA interference to try and study the genes required for this process. What is the catalog? But then always comes the problem that any biologist then faces is what is the mechanism by which these proteins make the microtubules grow? And so how can one work on the mechanism of the activity of these different proteins? It turns out one of the key steps forward for us was to actually go and work on the protein in a different organism, which was in Xenopus. Now, biologists like to move around between different systems to find the system which is most appropriate for the problem they're actually interested in. And so in this particular case, we use Xenopus because you can make extracts of cytoplasm where you can take away the membranes. Every time you work on a cell, you have the same problem, which is how do I get components across the membrane? The membrane of a cell has evolved over many millions of years to exclude most things it doesn't like. So you're always fighting as a biologist to get things across the membrane. Therefore, it's very helpful to be able to make cytoplasmic extracts without membranes. And in Xenopus, you can actually make very, very concentrated cytoplasmic extracts in which most of the things actually um, uh, many of the cell biology and cell division events we're interested in actually still function. So that's shown here. We've got a couple of frogs. You take the eggs, you crush the eggs in a centrifuge, and then you have a concentrated cytoplasm. You can add centrosomes to that cytoplasm and watch microtubule growth. And when we did that, we found microtubules growing in the cytoplasm. But the interesting thing is we were then able to remove XMAP from the extracts, so we can study the activity of XMAP in these extracts. So over here, we have a microtubules growing from a, a, a centrosome in an extract, an untreated extracts. And you can see lots of microtubules growing all over the, the, the cytoplasm. But then what we can do in Xenopus, we can make an antibody to the protein, and we can deplete it from the extract. And then you can see you hardly have any microtubule growth at all. So both in Xenopus and in C. elegans, XMAP is a key protein required for microtubule growth. So then we'd like to understand how does XMAP make the microtubules grow? And to do that, the first thing you have to do is you have to make the protein in a test tube. And then you can study it on its own. And that's exactly what we did, is we made XMAP in a test tube, and we also were able to tag it with a GFP, a green fluorescent protein, in the test tube. So we could also look at the activity of the protein as well as its localization. Now the work I'm going to talk to you about has been done together with Joe Howard, who's a close uh, collaborator of mine, and most of the work on the last, over the last 10 years on microtubules has been done together with Joe, who's a keen uh, cricket fan. And we'd like to look at the role of XMAP in controlling the growth rate of microtubules. Now in order to do that, we have to look at microtubule growth in a test tube, and we want to look particularly at the growth of the plus ends. And we can monitor that in the test tube using um, fluorescence microscopy. You can see the red segment marks the minus end, and the green segment marks the plus end. And you can see the, the green segment growing from the uh, red minus segment. Now what you'll notice is the red segment is stable. It's not growing and shrinking. And you can ask yourself, how is that? And that's key to our assay. By stabilizing the minus end, we can isolate the plus end growth and look at how that's regulated. Now, I just want to go into a little bit for you about how we go about stabilizing the minus end, because it's interesting both to think about the assay, but also it gives us a little bit more um, understanding of microtubule and tubulin biology itself. So what we're doing in this essence, we're making polarity mark microtubules. So what we do is we take brightly labeled tubulin here, so we've labeled tubulin in a test tube with a rhodamine dye, chemically attached rhodamine to tubulin. Then we warm it up and we make microtubules. The next thing we do is we take dimly labeled tubulin and we grow that from the seeds. And when we do that, we end up with the dimly labeled tubulin growing from the seeds. We warm it for another 15 minutes. And then we have these polarity marked microtubules with the bright minus end down here and a dim end that's grown off the end of it. Now, you notice what I said here is that the seeds are stable. So how do we make them stable? 
Well, there's, there's a number of ways, but the, the most important way, an interesting way, is to modulate the GTP hydrolysis cycle of the tubulin itself. So it turns out that a tubulin dimer has two molecules of GTP. Alpha has a GTP molecule, and beta has a GTP molecule. But when tubulin polymerizes into a microtubule, only the beta hydrolyzes GTP to GDP. Now, there are analogs of GTP um, which can affect this cycle. So the cycle shown here, where the tubulin dimer comes onto the end of the microtubule, it docks. When it docks, that completes the hydrolysis pocket in the beta subunit, so the GDP now hydrolyzes. So we think that mainly it's just the end of the microtubule that has an unhydrolyzed GTP. So what happens if we block the hydrolysis of GTP? Well, we can do that using analogs of GTP, as I mentioned. And there are a number of different ways of making analogs of GTP. If you, if you remember your um, high school chemistry, uh, you have guanosine and you have three phosphates at the end of any uh, um, nucleotide. And each one has a um, alpha oxygen bond between the two different, uh, uh, phosphate, well, different phosphate groups. Now, what it turns out we were able to do is you can modify GTP so that the alpha beta oxygen is a carbon. And you can see the name of that molecule above, GMPCPP, or guanylyl alpha beta methylene diphosphonate. And it turned out that this molecule was very, very good at mimicking the GTP state of um, tubulin. And when the tubulin goes into microtubules, what we discovered is that GMPCPP is no longer hydrolyzed. And so it allows you to ask, what is the effect of preventing GTP hydrolysis on the dynamics of microtubules? And when we did that, you get this very interesting result, which is that if you look at a GTP microtubule, it grows and then it shrinks and it grows again, as you can see on this graph of microtubule length against time. But GMPCP microtubules grew at the same rate as GTP tubulin, but they never transition to shrinking. And that confirmed old um, observations with other nucleotides that the role of GDP hydrolysis in microtubules is to destabilize them. You don't need GDP hydrolysis in microtubules to grow, but you do need them, GDP hydrolysis in microtubules, to shrink. So now, what we act do, do, of course, is make our seeds using GMPCPP, which is stable. And that way we have the following assay for the GMPCPP seed and the tubulin growing from the end of that stable seed. So now we have our assay. How are we going to analyze the role of XMAP? Well, you have to use a special kind of microscopy to do this, which is total internal reflection microscopy. And Joe Howard's lab developed ways to do this, to look at the dynamics of microtubules using total internal reflection microscopy, which is a way to just look at molecules which are very close to the surface of the cover slip. Now, if you take your growing microtubule, and then you take labeled XMAP and add it to the test tube, what you see is XMAP is very interesting behavior, is it's processive or it surfs at the end of the microtubules. So if you have a look at this, this um, figure here, you can see that the X map at the end of the microtubule stays with the end as it grows. It likes to be at plus ends, and it likes to stay with them as they're growing. So you can then begin to ask, what are the dynamic properties of X map at the ends of microtubules? by looking at single molecules of GFP XMAP. And you can do single molecule techniques using TERF, and you can begin to ask questions like, we know that XMAP is responsible for microtubules growing fast, and so how do the individual XMAP molecules behave when microtubules are growing? If we do an experiment like that, you can actually see the ends of microtubules as they're growing with the GFP XMAP, so when we use this assay, we can look at GFP molecules growing at the ends of the microtubules. And then we can ask, how long do individual molecules stay at the ends of microtubules before dissociating? 
And what we discovered was that on average, an XMAP molecule stays about four seconds at the end of a microtubule, which is about 25 tubulin dimers. So somehow, an XMAP is staying at the end of a microtubule, and it's helping tubulin to get onto the end of the microtubule. And how can that work? How can the XMAP molecule stay at the end of the microtubule and help the tubulin add on at a faster rate, which is required for the microtubules to grow faster? One of the clues for this was that TOG domains bind tubulin. Now, you remember that I told you at the beginning of the talk that XMAP is a molecule with many different of these TOG repeats. And so Steve Harrison's lab solved the structure of a TOG domain, was able to show that the TOG domains bind tubulin. And in fact, we were able to show that an XMAP binds one tubulin dimer on average. So then you can ask, how is it that XMAP, by sitting at the ends of the microtubules, helps these tubulin molecules get on to the end of the microtubule? One of the things we considered is that XMAP acts like an enzyme to catalyze the, the addition of tubulin molecules to the end of the microtubule. And there are two things that should happen if an enzyme is working in this particular case, if XMAP is working as an enzyme. The first thing is that it should also be able to make microtubules depolymerize if there's no tubule in there. And that is a classic feature of all enzymes that you work on. They go in one direction if they have substrate there, but if you take away the substrate, they'll go in the other direction. So synthetic enzymes often turn into degradation enzymes if you take away the substrate. And so that should be the same for microtubules. If XMAP acting as a catalyst, if we take away tubulin, one might expect it to start depolymerizing microtubules. And that's exactly what we found. If you add XMAP to microtubules in the absence of tubulin, then um, uh, microtubules start to shrink. And this had first been noticed by the Mitchison lab in 2003. The second thing is the critical concentration of growth should not change. And I bring this up just to explain what we mean by the critical concentration of the growth from microtubule ends, because you sometimes hear this term, and it's sometimes quite confusing to understand what it means. I remember when I first heard about it, I had a lot of trouble trying to understand what this actually meant. And the way to think about it is to come back and look at our microtubule and think that tubulin has an off rate and an on rate. The off rate is um, the rate at which um, tubulin molecules come off, and the on rate is at which tubulin molecules go on. Now, if you reduce the tubulin concentration, you reduce the on rate, so eventually the on rate and the off rate are matched. And that's a critical concentration of growth. Just above that concentration, the microtubules will now begin to grow. And so we can come back and ask, what is the effect of XMAP on the critical concentration? Because for a catalyst, if you raise the off rate, you'll also raise the on rate, and therefore the critical concentration should not change. And that's exactly what we found here. You can see the critical concentration of the growth. You can see the point where it goes above zero is exactly the same point. So therefore, what we conclude from these experiments is that XMAP acts as a polymerase, as, a, as an enzyme. And I think the key experiment we did to show this is to show if you take away tubulin, microtubules shrink. We add back a little bit of tubulin, microtubules just begin to grow. And we add more, and they start to grow even faster. So the cycle of microtubule growth and transition should be modulated by the amount of this XMAP protein in this cycle. So we think then that XMAP acts as a polymerase. And I took you through this story to illustrate a number of different things. At the beginning, I showed you how we can use genetic screens to get at the complexity of any particular system. But then I dive down to a little bit more detail to say, once you get that molecule, that's not enough. You then need to actually go and work on the mechanism by which it's had its effect. And that's what the goal we all have is, in the end, to try and work on the mechanism by which these individual proteins and their protein, com these protein complexes um, affect their um, <coughs> particular activity. And if you remember at the beginning, I said that microtubules are these very interesting complexes of proteins which grow and shrink in the cell. 
And you can see how the interaction between these protein complexes and other protein complexes modulates their activity in order for the correct biology to happen. I'd like to thank, there's two people mentioned who have been key to this work, was Gary Bruhart and Jeff Steer, who were key to this um, particular experiment. And I think it's a classic example of teamwork where the two of them work together. And I think it's very important to remember that these complex sorts of experiments, so we're discussing about um, XMAP and microtubules, depend very much on this sort of teamwork of people working together for a common goal.